Hi, guys. This is uh, God Sad for the Sad Truth. I first heard of this guest, I think it was on Rangan Chatterjee's show. I've become a fan of his show. Is that right, Asim? Did I, could I have heard you on that show? Does that sound right? Yes, uh, God, that would have been quite a few, I think a few years ago. Yes, absolutely. But I think that's when I first thought, oh, we need to speak. So let me introduce who you are. You are uh, Dr. Asim Malhotra, a British cardiologist and public health campaigner listed in 2016 as one of the 500 most influential British individuals by the Sunday Times. Are, are you still on that uh, list or are you off it now? Well, I think they just the list evolves every year. So uh, that was the, that's the only one I'm aware of. <laughs> Got you. Uh, author of three books. Let me read them. Uh, the most recent one, A Statin-Free Life, A Revolutionary Life Plan for Tackling Heart Disease Without the Use of Statins. That got my ears perking, uh, perked up because I, I have been put on statins. The 20-Day Immunity Plan, that came out in 2020. And the Piopi, am I pronouncing that right? Or is it Piopi? Absolutely, Piopi, absolutely. Piopi Diet, a 21-Day Lifestyle Plan in 2017 with Donald O'Neill. You've produced two documentaries, one that's forthcoming you're you're looking for funding the earlier one is the bit the big fat fix and the most recent one which i'm sure we'll talk about first do no farm p-h-a-r-m and i'll put the link to the to the documentary did i cover the main part or do you want to add anything no that sounds great god absolutely perfect okay so i thought we'd start first is uh just some uh kind of trivial stuff number one one of my maternal cousins is a very eminent cardiologist in La Jolla, California. I'm wondering if you know him. His name is Maurice Bookbinder. He's got a million different uh, patents, including one for the balloon catheter technique. Does he ring a bell at all or, or not? That, that's interesting. No, I'm not familiar with his name, but certainly I'm sure I'm familiar with his products for ah. sure. Because I, I trained as an interventional cardiologist, so I know a lot about heart stents and that kind of stuff. Exactly. Although I don't know whether he necessarily agrees with some of my views on it, but we can talk about that later. <laughs> we, we, we'll drill down on some of those views in a, in a moment or two. The second one, which I thought is kind of a cool uh, factoid that some people might not know. I know that you trained at the University of Edinburgh so in, in Scotland. Now, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. there is a tradition in Scotland, maybe in the rest of Britain, whereby when you get your primary medical degree, your doctor, once you become a surgeon, you revert back to Mr. to differentiate yourself from, you know, the, the lowly general practitioners. Are you familiar with this, uh, this yeah, appellation? It still, God, it still exists actually throughout the whole of Britain. Yeah. And I think it was uh, the, the history of it is that um, your surgeon originally going back centuries was your barber. So they were not, they weren't actually qualified doctors, the person that would cut out, you know, swellings or whatever else. Or, or perform an operation on you or cut you or cut your skin for the purposes of, of whatever um, was your barber. And that's why that's where the tradition comes from. So, yes, yeah, surgeons in this country, in Britain, are referred to as Mr. So so you're, you're walking at the hospital. You introduce yourself. I'll be your uh, cardiologist. I'm Mr. So-and-so. Don't, don't the patients, aren't they taken aback? No, I mean, it's part of the normal culture, actually, uh, to be honest, God, that's kind of accepted within Britain. So the patients understand that. Um, although, to be honest, cardiologists specifically comes under medicine. So we are doctors. Um, cardiac surgeons would be misters. I see. Interesting. OK, so I guess what I thought we'd start with is a third minor point, and then we'll get to the beefy stuff. I noticed that you were a, a big crusader against sugar, which reminded me. And then I went I went to check your bio and I saw a link. I've become friends and I had him on my show and I even invited him to uh, to an evolutionary health uh, promotion uh, conference at my university, Robert Lustig. Are you, do you know him well? He's a very good friend. Very, very good friend. I've known Rob quite a long time. And in fact, he was my initial inspiration into investigating and then becoming an advocate uh, to highlight the harms of too much sugar. For sure. He's a, he's a great man. He, he, he truly is. Uh, okay, so let's first begin with all of the various, I mean, I guess I think there are four controversies or classes of controversies that, you know, you've, 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 I, you've triggered in people. Let me just mention them. We'll, we'll cover all of them. The P.O.P. diet, some say it's bunk, although you kind of place it under the Mediterranean diet. And there certainly is a lot of evidence that that's a good diet, which I'm happy to hear since I'm from Lebanon, hence Mediterranean. Then the LDL heart disease 
uh, you know, link and you argue that statins is not the way to go. We'll talk about that. The implementation of dietary measures to reduce the risks of COVID infections, a more recent controversy. And then the relationship between COVID, MNRA vaccines and cardiac deaths. Let's drill down. Let's begin with the first one and go through all four. Let's do it. Sounds great. So so should we start with the first one, which would be the POP diet? I guess the difference between your version and uh, the traditional Mediterranean diet is that you're going high fat, no carbs, whereas the traditional Mediterranean diet would be a bit more sort of omnivorous. Is that is that a fair summary? Yes, uh, God. So actually, on on this particular issue, I mean, we're very um, explicit in explaining to people and trying to mislead people that, you know, I have been as a cardiologist, I got very uh, interested, although, you know, I started off as an interventional cardiologist. So most of my original work or what I did what I was good at was actually putting in stents into people. Um, but I went down the prevention side um, because I think that that was where we need more resources. And in that investigation, I, I discovered that, the, you know, diet itself, when you look at heart disease, you know, it depends what research you look at. But I think, you know, it suggests that maybe 50 percent, I mean, 80 percent of, of heart disease is environment and lifestyle. And within that, about 50 percent is thought to be driven by by diet. And when you look at the cluster of risk factors or the biological, pathobiological um, uh, mechanism of where heart disease really primarily is driven by, it's something called insulin resistance. So knowing that, then going back and looking at the research on the Mediterranean diet, was then trying to also trying to find out what components of the Mediterranean. You're absolutely right. So if you look at the Traditional Mediterranean, people think about bread. I mean, it depends which part of, you know, Europe, which part of Europe you're looking at, other Mediterranean region. Of course, in Italy, you're going to be talking about bread and pasta, that kind of thing. Pasta isn't a big thing in Spain, you know, but bread is, for example, or potatoes. So the question is, what components of the Mediterranean diet, according to research, are likely to be beneficial? And it wasn't the bread and the pasta. It was the extra virgin olive oil. It was the oily fish. It was the nuts and seeds. It was whole fruit and vegetables. And there's lots of evidence on showing how these sorts of foods can be anti-inflammatory. The other side of heart disease is it's now understood to be, and I also published in the medical journal on this with two cardiologists and created news headlines because we need to shift the understanding of heart disease away from this obsession with lowering cholesterol to a condition that is actually now best understood as being a chronic inflammatory condition. And we'll Again, come back to that when we talk about COVID vaccines. So I was at the forefront of changing the understanding of how heart disease develops and then what lifestyle changes can be implemented to help maybe reduce the risk uh, in terms of prevention of heart disease, but even managing and even, even possibly reversing heart disease. So to answer your question, um, when, when I looked at all of that, I said, well, you know, the, the, the best studies, both randomized controlled trials, even observational studies, suggest the Mediterranean diet is, is one of the best when it comes to heart, heart disease. And preventing heart disease but it wasn't clear cut in terms of what was it certainly wasn't um uh the information wasn't being conveyed to the public in the nuance that was needed and that's what i tried to do with the piopi diet so we took the traditional mediterranean region and then said listen the with the science that we know now the evolution of information it's likely that you know a low carbohydrate mediterranean diet is going to be best for heart health but um gad and i'm sure you're aware of this you know, diet actually comes from the original Greek word diata, which means lifestyle. So it was one major component, an important component, but all the other things as well in this piopi, which was the considered the home uh, of the, med- the traditional Mediterranean diet, because Ansel Keys, who was the biggest propagator of it, you know, did his research from the American physiologist. And it's also about, you know, being outside, not being sedentary. It's about stress an environment which which is it isn't something an environment that doesn't encourage chronic psychological stress probably also big factor maybe the most important god is sense of community so if you look at all these regions around the world these so-called blue, blue zones where people have you know high uh, health span like long health span they live they live long and they live well you know uh, of course there was very little ultra processed food so that's a likely component but the diets were quite different so what's the other factor? And it, it was a very strong sense of community, which, you know, meaningful relationships, as you probably know, is, is very good for, for mental health and, and uh, you know, one of the most important markers for happiness. 
but also it's probably a big component in terms of physical health as well. So that's really what the POP diet book talks about. Well, I'm, I'm really glad you talked about the sense of community because I, I had a quote ready for you. This is from my forthcoming book uh, on happiness. Uh, so this is from page uh, 41 of my book. Uh, psychiatrist Robert Waldinger, current director of the study, this is the Harvard longi longitudinal study that's been going on for, I think, 80 years, echoed Vaillant's conclusions, quote, and when we gathered together everything we knew about them about at age 50, it wasn't their middle age cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. Exactly to your point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think that is uh, an area now in terms of medicine and how we manage patients and and how we even think about how we, you know, structuring society to encourage that culture to go back to people understanding how important, you know, meaningful relationships are, our sense of community, even God, even simple stuff like, you know, uh, should we not be teaching kids with all the evidence we have about how to choose the right partner in life? I mean, there's, there's so another chapter in my forthcoming book, but go ahead. Oh, great. I can't wait to read that. <laughs> uh, okay. But explain to me, Asim, if you can, if you know, I would suspect you do, the proximate mechanisms that link up the sense of community and well-being to heart disease. So let, let's take the LDL story, which is another one of the controversies. So I, I'm a lay person. I'm not a cardiologist. Okay, I, I understand the distinction between LDL and HDL. I understand that LDL is the sticky thing that builds plaque. Therefore, I understand that if there is too much LDL, it seems to be building plaque. It narrows my arteries. That's not a good thing. So I'm I'm seeing here a mechanism, which I understand you're going to perhaps argue against. Debunk. Debunk. debunk exactly. And certainly as relating to statins, which are supposed yeah. to lower the LDL. How yes. would the arterial mechanisms benefit us in, a, in an actual physiological manner by the sense of well-being? What is the mechanisms by which that's happening? Yeah, great question. So it's not been well, well understood um, for, for, set for a long time until relatively recently. So first and foremost, um, chronic psychological stress now has been attributed as a risk factor for heart disease, looking at populations and subjective uh, surveys of stress as being similar to having high blood pressure or type 2 diabetes or uh, being a smoker. So the odds ratio is about twofold. So it increases your risk twofold. So that's established now in the literature. The mechanism, actually, there was a publication in The Lancet, I think it was 2019 or 18, if I'm not wrong. And what they did was they took uh, a number of patients, a number of people, and they did MRI scans, something called fMRI, a bit more detailed. And they looked at the, um, well, well, first of all, they they these these participants filled in subjective scores of stress. They then link those subjective scores of stress to activation in the amygdala, which is where a lot of emotional control comes from. And then they measured markers in the blood, which they thought might be contributing to uh, the development of heart disease. And those markers were essentially, uh, what happened is that markers of infl chronic inflammation and even markers linked to clotting increased uh, Gad in there. So we now have plausible biological mechanism, but it's very interesting if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective. Yes. Acute stress, of course, you know, in a fight, a fight or flight response, if we were, you know, I don't know, in the jungle and we're escaping from a saber toothed tiger, for example, it actually makes sense for our body to actually be ready for that potential injury to stop us bleeding to death. Yeah. So what would happen is the body would react so that clotting factors and inflammatory markers would be ready if we were cut or in a fight or whatever else, that we would be, um, you know, we would be less likely to bleed to death. So that's the, the likely mechanism. It, it's very plausible. It makes sense. The problem is the way we live now is that we have a lot of chronic stress, constant low grade stress, which over time links to the development of heart disease. Now, something else on this note very quickly um, which I think needs a lot more exploration. Most cardiologists and most doctors would think that you were mad or someone was crazy if they said that heart disease can be reversed. When I say reversed, 
I'm not talking about, you know, um, improving risk factors, which we know can happen rapidly. I'm talking about the actual blockages and narrowings, the coronary stenoses, you know, these buildup of these plaques, which are full of, you know, cholesterol and immune cells, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the best, in, the most interesting, and I say best evidence of this comes from India. Uh, a cardiologist who's an interventional cardiologist in India called Siddhis Gupta did a study in the early 2000s called the Mount Abu Heart Trial. And he put a group of patients who had what we call moderate to severe coronary artery stenosis narrowing, so at least 50 to 70% narrowings of their blood vessels uh, through a healthy lifestyle plan program. And he followed them up over a few years. And it, for, in India, in this particular group of people, it was a, a high fiber vegetarian diet. It was uh, doing two 30 minute brisk walks a day. And then it was also um, introducing meditation and you know, reconnection with your family and your friends, that kind of stuff. Followed them up over a few years, Gad. He repeated their coronary angiograms, which is the gold standard to look at the arteries. And he found that the people who'd adhered to the plan overall had a, an average, a 20% reduction in the narrowing of the arteries, wow. which is extraordinary. So 70% became 50, 50 became 30, which is unheard of. So the question, well, this is clearly has happened, but then what's done it? And, and then when he did a multivariate analysis, he looked in a bit more detail um, at those factors. The only independent predictor of heart disease, heart disease reversal, wait for it, 40 minutes of something called Raj Yoga meditation on a daily basis. Wow. So I actually implement this with my patients now because a lot of them come to me who have got something called calcium scores. They've been diagnosed with a bit of heart disease. They want to do something about it. And in all of these patients, I actually refer them to somebody who's a specialist in stress reduction. And I'm following them up and some of them have got stabilization of, of their calcium score. So it means their heart disease hasn't progressed, which is great. Some have even improved it and, and reversed that. So I think that this is really the future that people need to be looking into. Either way, it's a good thing to do, you know, first do no harm. Once people control their stress levels, hopefully their heart disease risk is going to reduce. But what we do know is their mental health gets better, their quality of life gets better, their sleep gets better. So it's a win-win. So, uh, I Regarding the reversal of the plaque buildup, I remember many years ago, Dean Ornish used to promise that, but in his case, it was through an exceedingly punishing uh, vegan diet, if I remember correctly, right? So so he's arguing that he too can reverse heart disease, but rather than it being through meditation, you do it through a very low fat diet, which will be contradictory to yours. So you see how people can get confused yeah. No, God, absolutely. So in my book, A Satin Free Life, actually, in the, I, I, I referenced Dean Ornish's work. I looked at his paper and his study, and it was very clear that he, again, did a multi-pronged approach. But when you analyze the, his actual paper, it's very clear that the low-fat vegan diet wasn't, was unlikely to be the factor in the reversal. So again, it was probably meditation. And I explained that in terms of the effect on cholesterol particles and all that kind of stuff in the in, in the book. Interesting. Okay, let's talk now about statin a bit more. I could even personalize it because in my last uh, physical exam, everything knock on wood was perfect, except my cholesterol levels were super high, even though I'm very fit and so on. So I was put from the usual you know, statin to the super crestor. Is this all wrong? Am I am I screwing myself up? What's going on? Or am I going to die of so, a heart attack? Or what's happening? Doctor, help no, me. No, no. So, so first and foremost, again, it's the evolution of the information and, and understanding it in a, in a better way, a greater truth, right? So LDL cholesterol, so-called bad cholesterol, traditionally was thought to be the bogeyman in heart disease because people with genetically very high levels of LDL cholesterol, GAD, did develop heart disease prematurely, and that increased risk was like 30-fold. But that was only in people who had something called familial hypercholesterolemia, which affects about one in 250 people. What we did, and I published on, is we looked at even that subset of people. And what we found, well, first of all, most people don't know this, 50% of people, 50% uh, of men who have familial hyperlipidemia, so LDLs that are through the roof, at least over 190 and probably 300 or so milligrams per deciliter, right? Um, of, the, of those, 50% will not develop heart disease prematurely. And 70% of women also in the same category will not develop heart disease prematurely. Question is, is there something to differ differentiate that subset of people that develop heart disease and the people that won't? LDL was not no different in those subgroups. What was different was people's uh, waist circumference, and people's um, having low insulin levels. 
So what that means is if you essentially sort out your lifestyle, even in that category of uh, being in that category, then your risk of a heart of heart disease or heart attack is only slightly higher than the healthiest person that doesn't have FH. On the other side, the reason why there was this push for many, many years, decades to say we should lower cholesterol as much as possible was people with genetically low cholesterol. GAD from original uh, study called Framingham, which started in, right. in the U US in 1948. You know about the Framingham study, it followed up 5,000 people, and risk factors and associations were made with different, uh, whether it was smoking or high blood pressure, whatever. People with genetically low cholesterol, again, less than 5% of the population, tended not to develop heart disease, certainly up to the age of 50 or 60. Let me fast forward. So, what I did to answer your specific question now, a systematic review um, in the BMJ Evidence Based Medicine, we wanted to ask, answer this question. Does lowering cholesterol, even with very potent drugs, whether it's statins or other drugs, is there a direct linear relationship? Because that's what we were told. The mantra amongst cardiologists, medical students is that, you know, there is a linear relationship. As you lower your LDL, your risk of a heart attack, stroke, et cetera, reduces. Was this true? Looking at the totality of evidence, not cherry picked, drug industry sponsored evidence, Gad, the totality of evidence. And this was published in Fairview Journal Systematic Review. There was no relationship. It's BS, right? What does that mean? That therefore the focus on lowering LDL cholesterol is misguided. It should not be the primary way of combating heart disease. But then, then if that's not true, how do statins work? Do statins have no effect? No, they do have an effect. But as I published in the, for the first time, actually, I published in this in BMJ in 2013. What I figured out when you look at all of the different trials on lowering cholesterol with drugs. Statins were the only ones who originally were found to have been beneficial, which means statins likely have a different, uh, an additional effect other than lowering cholesterol, which is likely how they prevent heart, heart attacks. And so that is that they have, an, they have right, anti-inflammatory and anti-clotting mechanisms, Gad. That's how statins work. But then the next question is, how much difference does it make? You know, as a doctor, you have to ask yourself two questions. Um, how, with any intervention or any drug, how much difference does it make and how do, how do I know this? And then you break it down in absolute risk terms, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which is, again, is not part of conventional medical practice, but is considered a much more ethical way of explaining information to patients. If you've had a heart attack, GAD, or you've been diagnosed with severe blockage, based upon industry-sponsored studies, with those caveats, selected patients, most of them don't get side effects, right? And I said to my patients, if you don't get side effects, you take this religiously for five years, there's a one in 39 chance it will prevent you having a further heart attack and one in 83 in terms of absolute benefit in terms of it delaying your death or, 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 or uh, prolonging your life. If you're not in the high risk category, Gad, you've not had a heart attack, you haven't got a severe blockage, then your benefit in preventing a non-fatal heart attack or stroke over five years is approximately 1%, 1 in 100, but with no mortality benefit. Now, with every patient I manage, these are the figures that I use in my conversations with them. And then I ask them, what do they think? A lot of them make a decision themselves, say, you know what, dog, that doesn't sound that great. Is there anything else I can do? I prefer not to take a stand. But some of them may ask me what I think. Of course, patients will say, doc, I'm not sure. What do you think? I tend to err on the side of caution with the high risk people and say, actually, you can probably be, you know, you, you probably should take a stand. But if you get side effects, then we should lower the dose or stop it altogether. And with the low risk people, if they ask me that question, I mean, I certainly, I mean, Gad, to be honest, personally, you know, I wouldn't take a statin, uh, you know, that level of risk or benefit. Um, and that's before we even talk about the side effect issue, which probably varies in terms of what reports you read, but anything from 10 to even 50% of patients at some point, depending on your, 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 your age and your sex and muscle mass and all sorts of stuff, may get a side effect, which is a quality of life limiting. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I know. That was fantastic. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I'm going to link what we're talking about to, I mean, my area, of course, is behavioral science, evolutionary psychology, psychology in general, and so on. So when I was, you know, being, it was recommended to me, oh, you know, let's, let's be safe. Let's put you on these statins, whatever. I resisted for a long time, Asim, because I have a very strong internal locus of control drive, right? So, you know, the the old, this is Rotter scale from the 60s, internal versus external locus of control. Internal locus of control, things happen because I control them. External locus of control is things happen because it's destiny, because it's the environment. And so to me, I felt that it would be psychologically injurious to my sense of personhood that it be a, a pill 
that helps me out of my conundrum rather than me implementing, you know, the necessary steps to ensure that I put all the odds. Eventually, though, I sort of snapped out of it because I kept being told that, no, no, your cholesterol is too high. You have to take it. Now, that said, I did end up losing 86 pounds. Uh, I'd always been incredibly uh, athletic. I've always trained, but, you know, I had been wow. a I had been a competitive soccer player. I was always very, very thin. And over about a 20 year period, you know, I went from being 120, 130, 135 pounds to my highest weight was 256 pounds. And so now I dropped down to 170. So, so I think, I wonder if for a lot of people who resist the urge of taking pills, it's precisely for the reasons that I'm saying, it's almost as if you're cheating. It's kind of like doing Botox to improve your look. I just want to improve my look by improving my look without external help. Sure, absolutely. In fact, that you know, the heart of ethical evidence-based medical practice actually is taking into consideration individual patient preferences and values. So you obviously felt, you know what, I'd rather avoid a pill. Just that curiosity, Gad, what was, um, was it low carb diet or low calorie or what did you- what So did I'll you tell go? you, and what? actually, it's, you know, thank you for asking us him. It was actually, you know, I've been, I've been on Joe Rogan. I'm only mentioning Joe Rogan because you recently were on it and, and you were great on yeah. it. Uh, so I've been on Joe many, many times, I think maybe eight times or something. And probably wow. the bit that was by far the most viral out of, you know, 24 hours of conversations was precisely when I answered the question that you just posed, which is how did you do it? So let me, let me tell you, and maybe it will help in your practice. Maybe. Sure. Uh, so number one, I do 15 to 20,000 steps a day, no matter what. It could be minus 20 degrees outside in the cold, in the harsh coldness of the frozen tundra of Montreal. I'm doing 15 to 20,000. Now that could be a combination. It could be a walk outside with my wife. It could be getting on the treadmill, biking. You know, I always have my phone with me. So it's always calculating my steps. I'll never go to sleep unless I've reached 15,000 steps. But as you know, of course, the thing that matters the most for your weight loss is what happens, what goes inside this guy. And so I try to limit my uh, caloric intake. And here, all credit goes to my wife because she's the one who's sort of the food Nazi. She keeps track of all my caloric intake through myfitnesspal.com. And I, I'm not getting paid to say their, their thing. Uh, so I try to average between fifteen to 1,700 calories, largely okay. protein and vegetables, and once I get beyond 1,700 calories, I, I shut my mouth. No more no more snacking that day. It took about eight right. months, dropped 86 pounds. What do you think? Amazing. Great. Listen, if it's working for you, Gad, I mean, that's it's all about what also works for the patient. And it sounds like if it's protein and vegetables, it's probably, I, I suspect, not lots of sugar and Not lots of sugar. Exactly. Right. Okay. So right. it's almost right. it's almost your POP diet, except though I yeah. didn't go out of my way to go super high fat, right? It just whatever yeah. the protein you don't was, need to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the protein approach actually, you know, is is very can be very beneficial for a lot of people. The, the um, other thing, and, and and how is your cholesterol profile now? I haven't checked it since the last time, so <laughs> so I'll let you know. I'll send you a private email. Yeah. Well, Gad, on this, actually, just I think it's also useful for you and for other people. So what I do is I don't look at the total cholesterol, the LDL, because I think they're very weak um, predictors, very, very weak predictors. You look at the ratio. The triglycerides and the HDL. So ideally, you want your triglycerides to be uh, less than your HDL. That's what you need to be aiming for. But that's well, what you look at, the ratio, absolutely. What I can tell you is that my ratio and my HDL were elevated precisely because I guess I exercise like a madman. So I'd like to yeah. think HDL that that's- great. HDL up is good, yeah. Oh, okay, good. All right. Uh, what, uh, so since we mentioned very briefly the evolutionary angle a few minutes ago when you were talking about you know chronic stress and so on, are you familiar, Asim, with the the evolutionary principle known as the mismatch hypothesis? Are you do you, do you know what that is? No, I'm not. No, please okay. tell me, educate me on it. Uh, right. Okay. So the mismatch hypothesis is a evolutionary principle that basically argues that many phenomena, many adaptations that would have been evolutionarily advantageous in our ancestral past in the current environment become maladaptive because there is a mismatch between the environment in which we've evolved and the current environment. So linking it to medicine, if you look at many of the top killers that are related to lifestyle issues, colon cancer, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, 
it turns out that the mismatch here is that you and I and everyone else walking the earth have evolved the gustatory preferences for high fat foods precisely because we evolved in an environment of caloric scarcity and caloric uncertainty. But now the only uncertainty I have is how long it's going to take me to get to the McDonald's. That's the only uncertainty I face. What's the trap? And so because there is a mismatch between my gustatory preferences that are really seeking to gorge and hoard tons of high calorie foods, and because I don't go out and spend you know 25,000 calories you know, uh, foraging or hunting my food, that mismatch leads to, I think, the top nine lifestyle preventive killers. So I wonder, I mean, you certainly didn't seem to have heard of that. Do yeah. most medical doctors incorporate evolutionary principles within their practice or no, regrettably no? No, God, God, unfortunately they don't. It's really interesting what you just said. I think the only thing I would add to that, that I think may, uh, I'd be curious to see what your response is. This obesity problem only seemed to kick off in the eighties, so late seventies and eighties. So you know, what were we doing for the several thousand years up until that point? Um, and, and actually, my my hypothesis, or I think an explanation that, that, and I think that what you're saying is correct, but I think what's happened is the food environment has been saturated with all these ultra-processed foods where, you know, the food industry realized that if you mix certain ingredients together with the fat, unhealthy oils, starch, sugar, you create these very hyper-palatable foods, probably also, for many people, addictive. And addiction, of course, as you know, is the opposite of free will. And then the environment becomes, you know, these foods become unavoidable. I mean, I even started campaigning at the very beginning, saying in the middle of an obesity epidemic, going back, you know, to, to 2011, wrote this article in the, in the Observer newspaper. said, why are our hospitals giving junk food to patients? Why are they a branding opportunity for the junk food industry? Why, you know, 75% of the foods purchased in hospitals get are ultra processed. So what's happened is food industry have managed to saturate the food environment with these foods that are unhealthy and unavoidable and encourage overeating. I think that's probably the main driver, but of course, yes, they are exploiting, as you've said correctly, something within us from an evolutionary perspective. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think, I mean, what you, your timing, you said, I think late seventies, early eighties, it completely coincides, I think with the clock, the timeline clock that Robert Lustig had mentioned when he talked about in his own practice, sort of seeing the uptake of childhood uh, diabetes, right? He, he was telling me, I, I hope I'm not getting any details wrong, but roughly speaking, he was telling me that, you know, uh, he, he used to never see, you know, 12 year olds with ridiculous, you know, uh, blood sugar levels and so on. Whereas, you know, starting around the uptake in the eighties, he started seeing that. So I think it completely jives with what you're saying. Now, interestingly, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm housed in a business school. I study consumer behavior. I studied the, the biological basis of consumer behavior. It, it seems regrettable to me that you know, something as fundamental as consumption, right? In this book right here, in The Consuming Instinct, I talk about you know taking Descartes, I think, therefore I am, and I change it to I consume, therefore I am. I mean, most of the things we do short of breathing is consumatory. And yet somehow the medical profession doesn't connect with the consumer scholars but we know that most of the preventable diseases that we succumb to are related to problematic consumption, correct? So why do these two camps, don't, is it just the, the kind of territorial academic silos that defines academia where we don't speak to each other? What, what's driving the fact of not building bridges that should be natural? Yeah, we should be building bridges. I think what the problem with in the medical profession, and things are evolving slowly, is that we haven't, when we practice medicine, we do very little on addressing root causes. We're kind of there to patch things up. You know, someone's high blood comes in with high blood pressure. Here's a pill. Someone's got a cholesterol problem. Here's a stand. You know, you've got diabetes. Here's some pills for it. There isn't a the, the first line approach isn't to do a root cause assessment of the problem. But also, Gad, it may surprise you, but most doctors get very little training at all in in nutrition in medical school. And even if they do, it isn't even accepted or even understood by most doctors. And I'm sure you're probably much, I mean, you know, speaking and having friends like people, Robert, Robert Lustig, and through all your reading and experience, you probably know a lot more, dare I say it, than many, many doctors when it comes to the impact of diet and uh, on chronic disease. So I think we shouldn't make that assumption that your doctor understands or knows about it. And that's not, and that's not part of our training. And it's, you know, and then of course you've got, uh, and we'll come on to this anyway, 
uh, we've also got the addition of the uh, the ideology behind medicine. You know, I always tell people that medicine itself isn't an exact science. It's an applied science. It's a science of human beings. But many doctors believe that it is. And therefore, they have a biological mechanism they see in association with, say, high blood pressure and stroke. And they think, here's a filter low blood pressure, and we're done. And you can go out and enjoy yourself. Some doctors, and I know this, I won't name them, some very eminent cardiologists tell their patients they can eat what they're like as long as they take a statin. Now, I've just told you the benefit of statin at best is 1%. But if people, if patients are going away with that message, they're probably increasing their heart attack risk under the illusion that they are reducing it if they're going to eat what they like. So this is a big, big problem, God, with the, well, with the, the, current, the current medical model. So it seems, you know, the old school country doctor who got to know everybody in the community, you walked in, you talked to me for 30 minutes, tell me about your marriage, how are your kids doing? You don't do that in medicine anymore, right? You're just sort of part of this, you know, this uh, this herd of people that I have to see five minutes at a time. And actually, that's something that had very much resonated when I would listen to Rangan Chatterjee, which we mentioned earlier. He seems to be the type of guy who, you know, is, oh, you know, you seem to have high blood pressure. Why don't you take up a hobby? You never imagine a physician telling you that. But and, and again, it reminds me sort of a similar uh, tension that happened in psychiatry, right? Where early psychiatry was all Freudian, was, you know, all, it, you know, it's your mother didn't hug you enough or your mother hugged you too much. Then it swung completely to the other side where everything was pharmacological, right? I mean, which of course, like most things in life, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Yes, you can sure. give someone who's got paranoid schizophrenia a pill to attenuate those symptoms, but for most mental health issues, you need someone to listen to you. Talk therapy does help. Cognitive behavior therapy does help. So like most things in life, the truth lies in the middle, correct? 100%, 100%. And I think, uh, you know, that's what we, we're trying to get to a greater truth and give people all the information to help them make those informed choices. But as you probably know, God, the, the current um, system is, is not uh, giving patients the best deal because a lot of what drives clinical decision-making for doctors is commercially corrupted information, yeah. um, which is you know, being put out by entities, and, and you're an expert in this more than I am, legal entities that only have an interest in making profit for their shareholders, not giving you the best treatment. And, and often in that process, we talk about drugs, for example, um, they will mislead and lie and suppress side effects and exaggerate the benefits of their pills. And uh, and then th if this happens across the whole system, then you know you can make an explanation as I do that why is our mental and physical health overall regressing? You know, if you look at the, well, I think in the U.S. you've lost about two years off your life expectancy in the last few years, which is extraordinary. We've stored our life expectancy in the U.K. since 2010, and yet we've got more people living longer with chronic disease. So in other words, the net effect on health is negative. So I myself, as a doctor, think to myself, hold on a minute. What responsibility do the medical profession have in this? If we were doing everything according to, you know, independent, ethical, evidence-based medicine, this wouldn't we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. So that that's a I mean that's a beautiful segue to you know uh, first do no farm, which I want to talk about. But the last two contentious issues, which would be the the COVID positions that you took, which kind of serve as good segues to. To, to the, that documentary that you, you're about to put out, what are your positions on those two? So number one, better diet reduces, uh, you know, how bad my COVID infection trajectory might be, number one. Number two, COVID MNRA vaccines increase the chances of cardiac, uh, you know, events. Tell us about those two stories. Yeah, so very early in March 2020, actually, God, be partly because also a lot of the work I'd been doing and the research and the analyses I'd be doing, which I which I thought was very powerful, is that dietary changes rapidly improve metabolic risk factors. So risk factors which are strongly associated with the development of heart disease can be rapidly improved. Just And that's why the 21-day thing isn't a gimmick. It actually is when you start to see those big improvements within 21 days. Some people can even send their type 2 diabetes into remission in 21 days. So that would be, what would be the marker there? Excuse me for interrupting you. What would be, it would be just your, your, your H, sugar levels? HbA1c, yeah, your average glucose control, HbA1c, yeah. So they can do that within 21 days. It seems to peak at three months and it probably continues up to about a year, but that, that can happen quite early on. And of course, the same risk factors 
that are linked to type two diabetes and, and their complications are the same ones for heart disease. So, so because of that, you know, early on uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, when information was coming through from China and Italy, it was quite clear. Of course, this was predominantly quite devastating as a as a as a disease in the elderly. But after that, it was very much linked to these metabolic risk factors, type two diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, etc. And because I know that you can improve those risk factors, I said, listen, this is a great opportunity for the government to come out and say, if you follow a dietary pattern which eliminates ultra processed foods, eat real foods, limit the starch and the sugars, you're probably likely to be in a position where your immune resilience is better. And therefore, um, you are going to be in a much better place to deal with COVID when, uh, if and when you catch it. And of course, you know, pretty much I think everybody in the world has had COVID now. So that's where I started from. And I, I spoke about it on Sky News. And then I, I ended up um, writing a few articles. One was featured on the front page of the Daily Telegraph. And then I was, you know, BBC and whatever else talking about it. And then Matt Hancock, the Secretary for Health, asked me, you know, um, at the time, what, he asked me for advice. What is, what is the um, link between COVID and obesity? And what should we do? And I said, well, Matt, to be honest, one of the, the, the biggest healthcare breakthrough in the last five decades, Gad, globally, was actually taxation of cigarettes. Right. 50% right? of the decline in heart disease death rates that happened in the last four, four or five decades happened because of smoking reduction. And the one factor that drove it, or the biggest influence on that was taxing cigarettes, as well as things like public smoking bans. So I said, you should apply the same principles to ultra processed foods. Very briefly, Gad, 60% of the American diet now of calories is ultra processed food, 50% in the UK. A lot of studies, observational ones, and one randomized controlled trial showing that these foods are certainly linked to, you know, heart disease, cancer, dementia, even independent weight loss. And, um, and that's exactly these ingredients that have been put together by the food industry to get people hooked to these foods. And uh, I said that you should apply the same principles to ultra processed foods. And uh, I, I think very quickly, you will see improvements in population health because we know that you can rapidly reverse these diseases and send them to remission. So that's really the link between, uh, and of course, later on, Gad, we know that 90% of the deaths globally that happened from COVID happened in countries which had a pop populations which were um, had um, at least 50% of the population, sorry, who were overweight or obese. Right. Right. So it seems to have been confirmed. There's also good data on vitamin D deficiency, which I talked about and wrote about in my book, Immunity Plan. Um, one study showed that 80% of the people that died from COVID had severe vitamin D deficiency. So again, there were simple things that we could have all done, or certainly public health could have done better to get people in a, in a, in a better state to deal with COVID. So that's the COVID side. And then I think the second question was on the COVID mRNA vaccines. And, uh, that's right. But before we get to that one, I mean, yeah. the, the link between COVID and obesity seems obvious that, that you know, that all, for all things, the thinner you are, the better for most things. So that seems obvious. Is is the fact that that, that position that you're taking, that it's controversial, is that you're, oh, in their view, you're overselling the promissory element of that link? Is it you're saying, is that the contract? Because clearly... No. It has to so be the true. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is the controversy, Gad. And, and so there's common sense and likelihood of benefit. And then there are people that say we want a randomized control trial to prove it. I see. Okay. So you don't that, have that's the... where that's where some of the detractors came in. Got it. And uh, you know you can always and that's you know it's a fair point. And therefore you shouldn't oversell things. And I said, listen, it is likely this is going to have a, an important you know Im impact on your immune resilience. And I think that, you know, and again, it comes from the first do no harm principle as well, right? If you're telling people to eat a healthy diet, I mean, you're not going to kill them and you're probably going to make them, you know, healthier and in a better place. And even, and, and because of the vulnerable, and, and the thing is there is plausible mechanisms that are known that if you have excess body fat, it's linked to chronic inflammation, which basically um, means that you have a, a suboptimal or dysregulated immune system. Right. Um, and there's a lot of historical evidence on that. And I think there was ultimately a study, um, actually, that was, I think it was through bariatric surgery or something, where they showed that those people that had weight loss during the pandemic, who then got COVID, had much lower morbidity and mortality. So it was essentially proven, fine, it was one one or two studies. But I think most people now uh, wouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, calling me names or saying this guy's mad or crazy or what's he overselling. I think they've accepted that's probably true now. Got you. Okay, let's go to the last one, which is the MNRA vaccine and cardiac events. And then we discuss uh, with whatever time we have left, 
your latest documentary, and then hopefully we'll have you back for a longer conversation at some point. Take it away. Lovely. So um, evolution of this understanding of the COVID vaccines, um, GAD, came from me originally being somebody that took two doses of the, of the Pfizer mRNA vaccine uh, under the false belief because, and I still believe that traditional vaccines are very safe, but that a, a, a vaccine couldn't do any harm at all. A bit skeptical about the efficacy, it was it was rushed through, but I didn't think it would do any harm. Uh, information evolved over time. Something that made me look at a specific mechanism of harm from the vaccine was my my uh, father sadly suffered a sudden cardiac arrest having had chest pain in, in the summer of 2021. He was a very fit guy, age 73. He was walking 10 to 15,000 steps a day, by the way, during during COVID, very active in terms of the Indian community. He was considered the healthiest guy. There's no family history of heart disease. It was all very strange. And his post-mortem found two severe blockages. I knew he had some heart tests done a few years earlier, nothing significant, maybe something mild. But then what I realized is that something had caused a rapid progression of coronary artery disease. We then fast forward and then data started to emerge that showed a plausible mechanism that even within a couple of months of having the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, there was, um, this was published in circulation. Um, what happened was that um, a group of patients that were being followed up had their cardiovascular risk, risk of heart attack, for example, over a five year period, baseline risk jumped from 11% to 25%, which is huge, just within eight weeks. And for me at that point, I thought, okay, well, that fine, again, it's one bit of data, but if there's even a grain of truth in this, we will have a problem because lots of people going around with mild coronary artery disease that may not give them an issue GAD for 20 or 30 years may suddenly be presenting with cardiac arrests within a year or two, which is actually what we're seeing now. But again, one bit of data, um, I then looked, lots of other information came through. Um, one of them that was the most interesting, GAD, was the World Health Organization had actually endorsed a lift, which nobody knew about, or very few people knew about, of potential serious adverse effect, uh, effects of the mRNA vaccines uh, when the vaccines were being rolled out. And on that list, anything and everything that can go wrong with the heart is on that list, Gad, uh, from heart attacks to cardiac arrest to arrhythmias to heart failure to myocarditis. And then that's what we are seeing. The problem is a lot of doctors aren't diagnosing it because they're still caught in where I was briefly, thinking that it's not possible that a vaccine can do harm. And therefore leaving a lot of these diagnoses as unexplained or you had a bit of a heart issue, it's probably just because of that or whatever else. And actually, there is a clear mechanism of harm. We've got autopsy studies. We've got, I think that just to, without boring people, people may Google stuff and say, hold on, you know, there's some fact check doc org saying that Dr. Malhotra is cherry picking evidence or he's just talking about his dad's death or whatever else. The highest quality level of evidence, Gad, as you probably know, is a double blinded randomized control trial. That was the, the, the study that led to the approval of the vaccine in the first place, Dick Pfizer's vaccine, for example, or Moderna's. A reanalysis of that original trial was done by independent researchers who are very uh, high, uh, were very well respected in terms of their in scientific integrity. And they found with further information, they were able to reanalyze that original trial and found that you were more likely to suffer a serious adverse event from taking the vaccine. So that's life changing a disability or hospitalization than you were to be hospitalized with COVID during the original ancestral strain. Now, if you start from that position, where everything is corrected for all these confounders, and you have something that shows you a signal of harm that that's high, it was about one in 800 within two months, just short term, and it's more harmful on average than it is in terms of benefit. In my view, that suggests to me that it should never have been approved to be used on a single human in the first place. What? And, when, and I spoke to the lead, yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, I was, forgive me for interrupting you. What's the mechanism so is it is it greater inflammation? Is it uh, clotting? What what's causing this then? M multiple mechanisms, but yeah, you've you've hit on the nail on the head with the, with your first answer, Gad. What probably is is happening, and this is published in the journal Cell to explain it, is that the spike protein from the vaccine, which gets distributed throughout the body and can stay in several organ systems for maybe four months or longer, the brain, the heart, the kidneys, the liver, the ovaries, the testes, testes, either causes a direct toxic effect to those cells and those tissues or an autoimmune reaction. And that's why you're having, but of the, in the reanalysis of the randomized control trial, by the way, published in the peer reviewed journal Vaccine, the highest impact vaccine journal in the world. So this is, you know, proper, you know, you know, this is, this is the high quality uh, research is that 
Forty percent. Um, I spoke to Joseph Freeman, the lead author. He said that the 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 biggest proportion of serious adverse events from that reanalysis of the trial were conditions related to clotting, heart attacks, stroke, pulmonary emboli, or lung clots. So for me, it's a no-brainer. When we look at the excess deaths, which most of them around the world are predominantly cardiovascular or high proportion of the cardiovascular, we have to include as a likely significant contributory factor, not the only factor, the COVID mRNA vaccine. So that's why I came out and I published in a, in a, you know, in a journal at the end of last year. And I also talked about the system failures that led to this. And there's a question I want to ask you, Gad, um, and because I really want to get your opinion on this, because, you, you know, um, and get your perspective. So there's something called the commercial determinants of health. Have you heard of this definition? Commercial determinants no. of health. Okay. No. So, it's, so in public health, it's the strategies and approaches adopted by the private sector to promote products and choices that are detrimental to health. That can apply, apply to food products or even drugs, right? I have evolved this definition into something called, and I'll, I'll, back, I'll explain why, the psychopathic determinants of health. So Robert Hare was a forensic psychologist who was involved in the original uh, DSM criteria for psychopathy. And in the book, which you may have read, called The Corporation by Joel Buchan, Law Professor, and there's a documentary, um, I think it was released in 2001, he actually talks about, not always, quite often, big multinational corporations, and he gives the example of Big Pharma, by the way, here, in the, as a legal entity, I'm not pointing fingers at individuals within those companies, but as a legal entity, fulfill, often fulfill criteria in, in terms of the way they make money for psych psychopathy. So, you know, callous disregard for the feelings of others, incapacity to experience guilt, conning, uh, lying for the purposes of profit. You know, and you've got examples like what happened with Viox, you know, and Merck. Well, I was going to... If I can well, give an thanks. example, I had a guest on, you may know him. And if you don't, I, I'd, I'd love to connect you because I think th there's a lot of synergies. Do you know the writer, Patrick uh, Raiden Keefe? He, I don't actually. He wrote uh, an amazing book called Empire of Pain, uh, discussing the Sackler family with the op opioid crisis. And when you hear the story, Boy, it sounds as though they're psychopaths. Uh, so, so to your point, uh, I think the template that many of these companies use could certainly fit under the rubric of psychopathy. I, I think I, I, I would yeah, subscribe to then, that. Yeah, and and then I, I, I call it the psychopathic determinants of health. In fact, Richard Horton, editor of the Lancet, came to one of my talks in London a few months ago, and he he referenced it. He he talked about he described what I was discussing, and the reason I mention it, Gad, is. As a, I'm a root cause analysis guy. I'm trying to explain what's going wrong with healthcare. So I keep going to the root of the issue. And this is my hypothesis, okay? If you accept or understand the concept of the psychopathic entity, you know, at, at the root of the problem that has more and more control over our lives, you know, they fund academic institutions, they fund the regulators, that will have a downstream effect. Doesn't mean everyone's a psychopath but it will create a culture that is, is closer to that kind of behavior, whether you call it materialism or psychopathy or sociopathy, or whatever else. And I think that explains a lot of where we are right now in this situation when it comes to health. And when I say downstream effects on culture, I even remember um, you know, when my father died, there was an ambulance delay and there was, I discovered there was a government and Department of Health cover up around the fact that ambulance delays for cardiac arrests were, you know, unacceptable for several weeks throughout most places in the country. And I wrote about it and exposed it because I thought people needed to know and the, the public and doctors. And I remember contacting uh, a cardiologist who I, I respect, one of the good guys, and told him what was happening and said I was going to write about it in a newspaper and because people needed to know what's going on. And his response was, I wouldn't do that if I were you, Asim. You're only going to make yourself more enemies. And for me, I, you know, what has happened to the culture where doctors, and I spoke to even a cardiologist yesterday who was very much, I say, I would say, um, very senior cardiologist, I won't name him, who was supportive of my work and what I'm doing in terms of COVID vaccine exposure, but he himself is too afraid to speak out. And he, he agreed with me. He said, what's happened in medicine now is that many doctors are faced with a choice between doing what's right for the patient and protecting their own interests or their career, and they choose their own interests in their career.
Yes. So, so the, what has gone wrong with medicine? Uh, so my 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 so my uh, question to you, Gad, is: Do you think it's reasonable? My hypothesis is say this is a downstream effect of the psychopathic determinants of health. So I, I, I yes, I I would agree with it. Would would not to try to be too charitable, but psychopathy implies that there is a willful attempt to harm. And if I'm going to be charitable, in many cases. It's not that, you know, they all get together, Dr. Evil and go, bah, 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 I want to cause as much harm as possible, but rather that which the metric that they are seeking to maximize, to use the language of applied mathematics and operations research, what, what are you trying to maximize or minimize, doesn't jive with the Hippocratic oath, right? And therefore, yeah. it is that conflict that then causes the downstream effects that you're speaking of. So it may not necessarily be the willful desire to cause havoc and cause harm. But what yeah. I care about is getting my third home in the Hamptons. And therefore, if patients need to be harmed so that I can have better profit reporting, so be it. So I think that's probably what's happening. And again, I'm not trying to be charitable, but I just simply no. don't think that everybody is in cahoots to try to. No, you know, sure. all, does that I, make sense? I agree with you. I agree with you. I think it's just to understand there is an element to what degree that behavior is there is is, is to be determined. But I think there's an element of that. And in fact, it made, made me think about something else as well about you know the importance of speaking the truth. And I know that. You know, I saw a, a video, uh, you know, I'm, I followed um, Jordan Peterson's work for a while, and I know he mentioned you because one of the, the most powerful, um, most articulate ways of expressing the importance of speaking the truth, actually, he mentioned you in this in this video. I think he was on stage somewhere. I think maybe you were speaking with him. And and that was, uh, you know, it's so important to see, speak the truth. It's not safe to speak the truth, but it's yes. even less safe to not speak because the problem doesn't go away and it probably gets bigger and then it's much harder to overcome. 100%. So I think that you know, that resonated with me. And and to to put it in more academic language, I I draw a distinction between uh, two ethical systems. Asim, deontological ethics and consequentialist ethics. Consequentialist ethics means you judge the ethical merits of a an action that you take based on its consequences. Hence, the downstream effects that you're talking about. So if your if your spouse asks you, "Do I look fat in those jeans?" and you decide to lie, well, in that case, you're lying in order to spare that the person that you love's feelings, and that makes sense. So for many things, we are consequentialists, and it makes perfect sense to be so. On the other hand, I argue in this book, the yellow one, The Parasitic Mind, that the truth, the pursuit and defense of truth have to be deontological. In other words, I never equivocate on the truth in order to modulate some consequence. I'm either a truth seeker and a truth defender, or I'm not. So let's link it, for example, to freedom of speech. I'm Lebanese Jewish. I ex I escaped execution in Lebanon, so I've lived my Judaism very uh, dangerously, and yet I support the right of Holocaust deniers to spew the most offensive garbage because the deontological principle of freedom of speech supersedes everything. So the consequences of me being hurt and upset by those assholes doesn't matter. The deontological principle is more important. So the Hippocratic yeah. Oath, first do no harm, is a deontological uh, you know position that should never be equivocated on which leads us very quickly because i know you have to go yes. can you tell us about your upcoming documentary yeah thank you god so yes it's called first do no farm i'm co-producing it with uh, the same person that i did the big fat fix with donald o'neill um, and really what we want to do is take people on a journey to help them understand really why we've got this healthcare crisis and the role that the pharmaceutical industry have played in over-medicating the population and all the harms that come with it, but also give people solutions. So for example, I think the big issue, the low hanging fruit is that we need to remove commercial or financial conflicts of interest from health policy, people who are influencing health policy, the regulators, for example. And if we do that, then we are more likely to get you know, cleaner information when it comes to clinical decision-making. Coupled with that as well, uh, Gad, is the importance, as you would well know, of simple lifestyle changes and how powerful that can be. Uh, and actually, that there needs to be an overall shift where the first line approach to managing all these chronic conditions should be lifestyle with medication as a backup, with informed consent, with telling people the absolute benefits and harms based upon information that people can see as reliable. And that's really where we want to shift 
um, you know, the understanding of, of, our, of, 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 of health and medicine, but also give individual solutions for their, for their health as well as policy makers uh, and empower them. And of course, we'll go to the roots of, of where this probably all started to go a little bit astray, which, you know, we, we, in, our, in our promotional video, we, 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 you know, we allude to the neoliberal, I'm sure, again, you know this probably a lot more than I do, those neoliberal economic policies introduced by Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, which has unfortunately got to the point where I think these entities, you know, these commercial entities that have a, a primary purpose, you know, conflicting with the Hippocratic Oath in creating profit, um, have got way, way, way too much power now. Wow. So where are you? What stage are you at in the produ production of this uh, documentary? Yeah, so we just we just do. Yeah, we're just doing the crowdfunding at the moment. So we want to hopefully start filming in the summer. Most of the filming will be done in the United States. So we've got some really uh, prominent people that are going to be part of it. Robert Lustig, who you already mentioned, is going to be interviewed. Um, Jay Bhattacharya, you know, of course, I love him. He, he's yeah, actually and, one uh, of my endorsers of my forthcoming book. He's just what oh. a gem. He's a great guy, great guy. And also, and hopefully John Ioannidis as well, who oh, I yes. describe as like the Stephen Hawking-like figure of medicine. Um, and uh, and and John Abramson, who you may be familiar with. So I don't he's think a so. Harvard doctor. Um, he's done probably more than anyone in the US being involved in litigation cases involving the drug industry in terms of, you know, uh, suppression of data. Um, and John, uh, yeah. So, so those are the, the people at the moment. We'll have a lot more interesting characters to bring in there. And I want to, you know, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. I try and do the best that I can. And I want to make this the, the most hard hitting, best uh, medical big pharma documentary ever. And wow. uh, and hopefully we will, you know, through that crowdfunding and some big donors will hopefully come in. We can produce some really good quality and get it out early next year. Uh, that, as I was going to ask you, so it'll be out in early 2024? Yes, that's the plan. Absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. So, hey, listen, I could talk to you for another five hours. You need to go and I need to go and face the firing squad, also known as Pierce Morgan. So yeah, uh, that, that, wish... that sounds amazing. I'm excited for you. That, enjoy that. I'll be, <laughs> that'll be so great. Much. I can't wait to watch that one. Thank you. Uh, stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline. Thank you so much for coming on. I see you're truly a delightful guy and I'd love to speak to you again soon. Thank you, my friend. Cheers.